So when I was asked to speak a week or two on this, uh, for this Being Like Jesus series, I quickly agreed. It sounded like a great series, and I was eager to play a part in it, right? So then I asked if there was a particular topic I was, you know, supposed to preach on. And uh, I wasn't familiar with the content yet. I hadn't bought the book yet. So uh, it sounded great, but I didn't know much about it. And uh, I was told that the topic for the week I was going to preach was the, uh, the fourth habit in the Being Like Jesus series. The fourth habit being solitude. And I remember thinking like, wait, wait, excuse me? Solitude? I, I thought it was a joke when I was asked to preach on solitude. So I laughed. I laughed because I thought, I am probably one of the least likely people to speak with any authority on the topic of solitude. Uh, I tend to be somewhat extroverted. I get my energy from being around people. I'm, I'm rarely, seldom alone. It just doesn't, you know, solitude is not one of my strengths. It doesn't fit my lifestyle or my, my personal history. So when I was asked to preach, preach on solitude, I was like, are you kidding me? Solitude? Yeah. Right, it is not a fit, uh, probably because I really didn't understand the meaning and the purpose of solitude. Because like at first blush, when I first heard it, I associated solitude with solitary, like in a solitary confinement, right? And I'm thinking, isn't that punishment for like reserved for the worst of criminals, the most incorrigible troublemakers who are already in jail? It isn't solitary for those who you know, instigate riot and revolt while in jail. I mean, solitary is for people who, you know, they're sent to cell block D. That's, that's solitary. That was my thinking. That was my association. So my perception of solitude, because of this association with solitary, is it's all bad. It's bad. Solitary is something to avoid because it's designed to break you away from all social interaction. So you become defeated and depressed, a mere shell of a person. That was my original thinking, right? My first association was like, you want me to preach on that, on solitude? Well, you, of course, you understand that solitude is not the same as solitary confinement. Solitude is not self-imposed solitary confinement. I've come to understand my initial response. It was over the top and a total misunderstanding of both the purpose and the practice of solitude. And it's actually my hope to help you have a clearer understanding of the practice of solitude, that you'll not only think about it differently, but you'll actually begin to seek solitude as a, as a beneficial habit, as a powerful practice to build into your life as you train to become more and more like Jesus. So here we are. To talk about solitude, fourth habit in our 40-day Being Like Jesus challenge. Solitude was actually a habit that Jesus regularly employed during his earthly ministry. Scripture records that on several occasions, Jesus sought solitude, away from the crowds, away from the disciples, away from the constant press of the demands and needs all around him, right? The need to heal people, to teach the crowds, and to, to train that, that ragtag group of followers to kind of carry on the message once he was gone. And not a message about a religion to follow or rules or regulations or rituals, but Jesus had a message of a relationship, a relationship that anyone can have with the God and Father who created them. This was the radical message that Jesus preached, that we were created for a relationship, relationship with a father as a dearly loved son or cherished daughter with a heavenly father who has designed us and loves us. So Jesus would regularly slip away to be with this same father. I almost said that Jesus would slip away to be alone, but that's not right. That's not right. That was not his purpose. Jesus did not seek solitude to be alone. His purpose was to be away by himself not alone, but with his father. Remove himself from the crowd to be with the one. See, Jesus' purpose was not to get away from people. 
His purpose was to get together with his father. There's a huge difference between the two. In fact, it's actually the critical difference between that makes solitude dramatically different from simply being alone. And I'm going to try and net it out for you. The goal of solitude is to become more aware of God's presence. I'll say it again. The goal of solitude is to become more aware of his presence. Because when we're aware of his presence, we can then invite him to show us what's on his heart. And we can join him in what God is doing. And then we have the joy and the privilege to release his presence, his love, and his goodness on people as the hands and feet of Jesus. See, we get to be the natural part of what God is doing supernaturally. This is the purpose of solitude for those of us who follow Jesus. So maybe the best way I can explain the practice of solitude is by simplifying this practice into four steps. I'm not saying there's the one and only formula for practicing solitude, but it's it's just the best way I can communicate the primary purpose and practice of solitude for those of us who are training to become like Jesus by following a simple pattern that he employed during his earthly ministry. So here's the four steps for practicing solitude for those of us who want to be like Jesus. Because if we believe the primary purpose of solitude is to become more aware of his presence, we need to first quiet the noise, remove distractions. Second, we need to become aware of his presence. We need to focus on Jesus and become aware of his presence through prayer and thanksgiving and worship. Third, we need to then invite God to show us what he's doing. And then finally, we join him. We join God in releasing his goodness and grace on those all around us. So one more time. The primary purpose of solitude is to become more aware of God's presence. I say aware of his presence because he's already there. He's already present. You and I are just unaware of his presence most of the time. The Bible tells us that he is present in the life of every believer. In fact, Jesus taught that believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, once they put their faith in him. Jesus further told his followers that through this Spirit, he would be present with them wherever and forever, continually present with them even after he ascends back to heaven. So the presence of Jesus and the person of the Holy Spirit is not in question. He's there. It's just that he is present in every believer. You and I are just oblivious to his presence most of the time. But if you're a believer, the very spirit of Jesus, the presence of God is in you. In fact, the baptism of Jesus initiated this truth. The Gospels tell us that when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, the heavens opened up and a voice from heaven proclaimed, you are my son in whom I'm well pleased. This was after a dove, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, descended on heaven, on Jesus, and landed on him, right? Think of it. The Trinity is present at Jesus' baptism. Jesus gets baptized in the Jordan River, the Spirit descends as a dove, and the Father from heaven declares his pleasure in the Son. It's awesome. It's amazing. The Trinity is all there, present in one account. And then the Gospel of John includes an account of what happened next, the very next day following Jesus' baptism. Listen to this. It reads like this in John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, after his baptism, the, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And John explains why he could confidently make this bold claim about Jesus, proclaiming him as the long-awaited Messiah. John testified that immediately after baptizing Jesus, he saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and land on Jesus. John 1, verse 32, then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on Jesus. He continues, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So John the Baptist concludes in verse 34, I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. I mean, think of it. 
The confirming evidence that Jesus was the much anticipated Messiah was that the Spirit of God remained on him following his baptism. That was the sign. The dove that descended from heaven didn't fly away, didn't withdraw, but remained. John the Baptist saw this and he concluded, he's the one. He's the son of God. He's the Messiah. So then he boldly proclaims to all within earshot, look, it's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, ever since Pentecost, the continual presence of the Holy Spirit is available to every believer. Jesus himself declared that the Holy Spirit is the gift. He's the gift given to believers to be with us and live in us. That's the promise from Jesus himself. So his presence is not in question. How is it then? How is it that we believers can sometimes be oblivious to the Spirit's presence when he's supposed to be living inside us. And maybe the better question for us today is this. What needs to change? What needs to change so that the Holy Spirit's presence is more pronounced, prominent, and prevalent, and more impactful in the way we live? That's the question. I mean, think of it this way. What if an actual dove landed on your shoulder and you wanted him to stay? You wanted him to stay. What would you do? How would you walk around and go about your day if you didn't want the dove to fly away but to remain? I think the practice of solitude contains the answer to you and I hosting the Holy Spirit's presence well. Here's the answer. If you want the dove to remain, your every step, your every movement would be with the dove in mind. Your lifestyle would be oriented around being aware of the dove, sensitive to the dove, being sure to maintain the presence of the dove, the dove being the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Galatians 5.25. He says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. If we want the Spirit's presence to remain, we need to become more keenly aware of his presence so that we move with the dove in mind. We adjust our life to the dove. That's how we keep in step with the Spirit. This awareness of his presence in us and at work all around us is the primary purpose of the practice of solitude. But this awareness is not the first step we need to consider if we're to practice solitude as a habit. If you and I are to become more keenly aware of the Holy Spirit's presence, our first step needs to be quieting the noise in our life that drowns out the Spirit's still, small voice. The first step is to remove the distractions that cloud and crowd out the awareness of his presence in our lives in the first place. And you have to figure out what this means for you personally, right? For most of us, quieting the noise and removing distractions will certainly mean managing our technology effectively right? So that your phone and social media, TV and computer screen do not totally dominate your time, your energy, and your affection. It will mean proactively scheduling and carving out times of solitude so you can be fully aware of the Spirit's presence. And if you don't purposely like remove distractions, or more accurately, maybe it's remove yourself from distractions, your awareness of the Spirit's presence in you and at work around you is not likely to change. And you'll miss out on all that God has in store for you in Him using you to represent Him in this broken world all around you, right? The Spirit of Jesus inside you is dying to get out. He's dying to get out through your mouth as you bless people and through your hands and feet as you love and serve people. The practice of solitude, it starts with you quieting your life so you can become more aware of his continual presence. So once you've removed yourself from these distractions, quieted your life, you can now focus on the relationship that you have with Jesus through his spirit inside you, right? You can now focus on Jesus, his goodness and power, his great sacrifice for you on the cross, you, all that he's done for you. You can focus on his love for you, his great affection for you, on all his promises to be with you, to empower you, to strengthen you, on all the truth that you've gleaned from your study of scripture, 
the truth that you embrace and know to be true. You need to kind of focus on that. When you do that, when you focus on him, both by speaking and listening in prayer, through worship and thanksgiving, you will, you'll start this intentional focus is the, is the very practice of solitude. It may last a day. It may last an hour. It may last just a couple of minutes several times a day. See, the, the duration of your focus time will vary. But the key for us is to intentionally focus, right? To direct our awareness and our affection on Jesus, who is present in the Holy Spirit inside us. We're trying to move with the dove in mind. So once distractions are removed and we focused our heart and our affection on Jesus, and we have this sense, we have this awareness of the Holy Spirit's presence in us and at work all around us, we now simply invite him to show us what's on his heart, what he's up to. See, because God is always up to something. He's at work all around us. In fact, uh, Jesus said as much in John 5, 17. Jesus said, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. See, he's always at work. So you ask, well, what has God up, what, what has God up to? Well, scripture tells us, uh, seeking and saving the lost, restoring lost sons and daughters, bringing freedom to those captive to sin, uh, mending the brokenhearted, giving hope to those who are harassed and helpless. I mean, the list goes on and on. See, and God invites those who carry a spirit to join him in his work and demonstrate the love and goodness of the Father to those all around us. Here's my problem. See, I, I can walk through my day practically oblivious to what God is up to all around me. I can be so consumed with my plans and my agenda and my needs that I can miss what God is doing and his purposes for me in any given situation. See, most of the time, if I'm gonna be honest, most of the time, I do not move with the dove in mind. My focus is usually all about me, right? The practice of solitude, though, it helps break this mindset. It helps pause my preoccupation with self. So solitude reminds me to like look and listen. I have found that once you invite God to show you what he's up to, he is more than willing to show us where he's at work. Here's a simple way that you and I can invite God to show us what's on his heart. So throughout the day, Throughout the day, several times a day, we simply ask God, God, what are you up to here in this situation? What's on your heart? What are you doing? And then we look for where God is working and then find a way to step in and join him. We try to go through our day with an awareness that God is at work all around us and he's eager for us to join him. Short bursts of solitude throughout your day. They will help us become more aware of his presence. May Maybe something like this. In fact, maybe you should try something like this this week. Uh, you wake up to begin your day. Take a minute or two, right? Focus on Jesus. Focus on his presence in you and his promise to be with you. Focus on those truths that encourage you and fire you up. Focus for a couple minutes and then say, okay, Lord, another day. What are you up to today? How can I join you to bless my family before taking off for work? You get in your car to drive to work. God, who should I be praying for on my way into work, on my drive in? I know you're setting me up for divine appointments. I want to be available to you. Who should I be praying for? You walk into your office, right? So what are you doing in my workplace, God? Who needs some hope and encouragement from you? Give me your words for my coworkers. You go out for coffee with some friends. Okay, God, what are you up to in this establishment? Who could use a touch from your spirit? right? Is there a need I can meet? Is there someone who, who needs me to demonstrate your goodness? You, you get the idea. It's simply living with awareness that God is always up to something, and you and I have an open invitation to join him, to bless, encourage, love, and serve others. It's the fourth step in this practice of solitude, right? Once we've invited him to show us what he's up to, what he's doing all around us, we actually follow through and look for ways that we can be God's hands and feet to join him in his work. We move throughout our day actively living with an awareness, awareness that the spirit inside us is at work all around us and we have this invitation to join him. It's living with the dove in mind. Try it this week. Just ask God to show you where he's at work and then step in where you see him moving. Ask him for 
the words you need to speak. He'll give them to you. Can I give you just like a simple real life example of how this all can work? So I was taking one of those two minute solitude breaks right in the office here at church, reminding myself of God's spirit inside me, asking God to show me what he was up to. And uh, I get this random thought. I get, I get prompted to go check on a car that I'm having repaired. Now, it's kind of a weird random thought because I hadn't thought about this car. I hadn't been concerned or thinking about the car at all when this thought came in. But I, I had just asked to show me what he was up to, where he was at work. And this, this thought kind of floods my mind. And so I, I decide to kind of just follow the prompting. I decide to follow through by going to the garage where the, the vehicle is getting repaired. So I arrived. I spoke with one of the mechanics who's done work for me before. He's we're friendly. I don't say we're friends, but we're friendly. And um, we're outside the garage. We're actually in the parking lot. And uh, I asked him about the vehicle. And he said that the vehicle needs a part. The part needs to be ordered. So the vehicle won't be ready for a couple of days. So I was like, oh, no problem. No big deal. So I, I, uh, I said, I'll come back whenever it's ready. It's, it's, no, it's no big deal. So I, I decided I'm going to leave. And I'm thinking, well, that was a bust, but I followed through. And um, it was freezing outside, so I was actually eager to get back into where it was warm. And uh, I didn't know I was there in the first place, right? I was following this weird, random thought. So again, I leave, and, uh, but the mechanic, he, like just, he just continues to stand right there, doesn't move. And he's looking down at the ground like he's sad or disappointed that my car wasn't ready. <laughs> so I kind of turned back to him, I said, hey, really, it's no problem. I I'll come back in a couple of days. I, I don't care, I it it's, it's no issue, really. And uh, again, turn to leave. He still stands there, doesn't move, looking down at the ground. And he's kind of like shaking his head. And, uh, he, you know, it's like he wants to say something, but he can't find the words. You know that look? So I, I start to realize, man, maybe there's something more going on here. So I whisper a quick, silent prayer and say, God, uh, what are you up to? and show me what to do, and give me what to say. I have no idea what's going on here. And uh, he continues to shake his head, and uh, I stand there for what was a uncomfortably long time, not saying anything. And then this guy finally looks up at me with tears in his eyes, and uh, he's choking with emotion, and he says, can you pray for me? Can you pray for me? And uh, I was like, okay, I, interesting, because I, I don't believe, I don't think this guy's a believer. I don't understand him to be one. Um, but he continues and he goes, I have been so depressed lately. I, I, I am so down. I just, I can't shake it. And then he, he goes on to say, everything in my life just seems hopeless. I, I feel helpless, worthless. I don't know what to do. And he looks back down at the ground before barely whispering, can you pray for me? So I go, okay, now I know why I'm here. Had nothing to do with a car being repaired. I said, here's, here's my chance. Here's my chance to breathe life into a guy who's gasping for air, who feels like he's going down for the third time. Uh, here's my chance to kind of give him some hope and represent Jesus. And so I take my freezing hand now and I put it on him and I just pray a simple prayer of hope, real simple, and remind him that God sees him and cares about him and wants to be there for him when he feels like he's drowning, like he's choking, like he's in some emotional prison when he has no hope. 30 seconds, no more. And uh, there's... No lightning flashes from heaven. You know, no miraculous repentance there in the parking lot. But I know this, that there's a, a broken mechanic who walks away thankful and grateful for a prayer and knowing that someone cares. And, and maybe even believing that there's a God who cares. And I walk away thankful that God trusted me to, to go represent him, to join him in the work he was doing in this broken man's life through a simple prayer of hope. I'm also thankful that I get to check up on this guy when I go to pick up my car in a couple of days. You see, 
you and I get to be the natural part of what God is doing supernaturally, right? It's such a blessing. It's such a privilege, right? It's God's purpose for all of us who carry his spirit inside us, simply to be aware of where he's at work and invite him to use us to be his hands and feet, to display his goodness and grace on people. See, solitude helps us to be aware of what God is doing all around us because he's littered our week with opportunities and appointments if we would just be aware of his presence, if we would just invite him to show us what he is up to. We'll come to see he's always at work. He's always at work. You will find him when you begin to look for him. When you and I become more aware of his presence through the practice of solitude. And you know what? As we become more and more like Jesus, we'll begin to anticipate. We'll anticipate opportunities to demonstrate his love and goodness. And we'll start to, we'll start to live with the dove in mind, in step with the spirit. We'll begin to walk and move and live expecting God to use us in any given situation. And we'll quit worrying about what if God doesn't show up and we'll start dreaming about what if he does? What if he does? See, the practice of solitude, it helps us become more, of God's, more aware of God's presence and our open invitation to join him. I'd love to pray for us. Let's pray. So Father in heaven, we are grateful, thankful sons and daughters that you choose to co-labor with us and use us to represent you. What a blessing. It is such a privilege for us. It gives us not only hope, but it just gives us total purpose. So I pray that, that as we seek solitude, as we quiet our lives, as we remind ourselves of the truths that you're in us, you are with us, you are for us, you are empowering us, you desire to use us. When we focus on that and we just then invite you to show us where you're currently at work and we join you, I just pray that you get lifted up, the people you direct us to get blessed, and we go away knowing that that invitation came from the God of the universe who wants to use us because he loves us as a son or a daughter. Help us to live that out this week and in the weeks to come. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.